All right, it's 12.01, so we'll go ahead and get started. Um, welcome, everyone, and thank you for joining our webinar, 10 Things That Non-IT Lawyers Should Know About IT Contracts and IT related or AI-Related Services. My name is Evan Foster. I'm the co-chair of Saul Ewing Cybersecurity and Privacy Practice, and I'm joined today by my colleague, Leah Leendecker. Leah is a member of our corporate practice group and our intellectual property practice. Before we begin, uh, I have just a few housekeeping announcements. Uh, questions can be submitted through the Q&A tool at the bottom of your screen. We will answer questions at the end of the program, uh, and we may take one or two um, during the presentation, uh, time permitting. Um, we'll do our best to answer all questions by the end of the webinar, uh, but should we run out of time, we'll be sure to follow up with you after the fact. Uh, CLE, today's program has been approved for CLE in a number of jurisdictions. As a CLE provider, we must be able to verify your attendance. Therefore, at random points during this webinar, we'll display and verbally announce two numeric reporting codes that you must record and report back to us using the CLE survey that you received in your webinar reminder email. The survey will also open automatically in your browser at the completion of the program. We will, in turn, send your certificate of attendance once we receive your survey response. Please be sure to respond to the Soluing CLE survey with your numeric codes within five days of the end of the program. Uh, the webinar recording and handouts uh, will be available uh, via a thank you email that you'll receive uh, after the end of the webinar recording. Uh, and that will include a link to the recording as well as a copy of the slides and the CLE verification survey. Uh, and finally, what webinar wouldn't be complete without a legal disclaimer. Uh, the provision and receipt of the information in this program is not legal advice and does not create a lawyer-client relationship and should not be acted on without seeking professional counsel who have been informed of the specific facts. Uh, and with that, let's begin. Uh, so to kick things off, um, you know, in, in terms of our top 10 list, um, we, we first, when dealing with any kind of technology contracting, uh, be it software, hardware, IT services, or uh, AI or machine learning, um, you need to understand some basic terminology. While you certainly don't need to be a programmer or a tech geek, um, there are certainly some basic concepts and vocabulary that you should be familiar with. Uh, client service and workstations, obviously these are uh, terms that refer to um, you know, various places where software may be installed or may be utilized from. Uh, and so having an understanding of, of those helps you understand the licensing model. Uh, object code versus source code. So understanding the distinction of those things. So object code uh, is the machine readable code that's actually the, the bits and bytes that get processed by the computer. Whereas the source code is the actual uh, code that's written by humans that uh, you know, is ultimately compiled and translated into the object code. Uh, cloud computing, that's a, a term that, you know, is bandied about a lot these days um, and sort of generically refers to uh, software that's delivered in a distributed computing environment, potentially from uh, many places around the world. Um, and we'll talk into some, we'll talk later about some of the considerations when you're dealing with cloud. SaaS uh, refers to software as a service. Uh, and these days, there are a number of variations of, of uh, we'll call it IaaS uh, or AaaS services. So that can include uh, platform as a service, uh, infrastructure as a service, such as Amazon or uh, Microsoft Azure. Uh, and generally, these refer to um, like a, a many, um, you know, and distributed model of either delivering software or infrastructure or technology, um, generally in a, in a what is referred to as a multi-tenant environment, meaning a single uh, instance that's pushed out to many different users. Uh, virtual machines. So this is um, uh, a term that is used to describe uh, software that is intended to mimic a physical device. Uh, and so these days you may have um, one piece of hardware that is um, div divvied up uh, via software to create multiple um, different pieces of hardware from which software is run. And again, this has uh, a bearing on how software may be licensed or how software may be used. 
Uh, understanding machine learning versus artificial intelligence and what the difference between those two terms mean. Uh, machine learning is generally uh, understood to mean uh, the process of a machine, uh, teaching a machine or a piece of software to do a specific task or recognize a specific pattern. Whereas artificial intelligence uh, is understood to generally mean uh, teaching a computer to think like a human uh, or to have um, you know, human-like responses to a question. Uh, and then a large language model or LLM, um, this, you know, we'll, we'll talk a little bit later about ChatGTP, but ChatGTP is one of many large language models. Uh, and a large language model uh, is essentially an algorithm that can recognize, summarize, uh, predict, and then generate output uh, based on a large quantities of text uh, or other information that's been included in the model. Uh, next slide. Evan, there's a um, there's a request to repeat the difference between object code and source code. <clears throat> oh, sure. Um, thanks for that. So um, object code um, is is the ones and zeros that um, uh, comprise a piece of software. Uh, and so it's not readable by humans, uh, whereas a source code is the actual um, uh, computer language uh, that, you know, humans write, humans code, uh, which then ultimately um, and is, is readable by humans uh, and then gets compiled uh, into ultimately the object code. So they're, they're sort of part and parcel of the same, the same thing, um, but the best understood is the source code is, is human readable and object code is not. Thanks for calling that out, Leah. Um, so the second thing to know, um, important topic to know when dealing with, with IT contracting and particularly when we're dealing with software um, is that oftentimes you are dealing with a license, not a purchase. Um, and so you need to be careful about using and sort of understanding um, the, the term purchase versus license and the distinction between the two. Um, so you purchase licenses, you purchase services, but you don't necessarily purchase uh, intellectual property or software. Sometimes you may, uh, but generally speaking, when you're you know getting a uh, you know buying a copy of Microsoft Office, let's just say, uh, you are in fact purchasing that copy. Uh, you aren't purchasing the the source code or the object code of Microsoft Office. Um, and that's important because um, all of these rights and the rights to software uh, and other IP may flow from copyright law. Uh, and in copyright law, the copyright owner holds certain exclusive rights to their intellectual property. The license gives the licensee certain of those rights, but not necessarily all. And the licensor can define the scope of that license and what rights it may want to give to the licensee and what rights it may want to retain. Um, that license may be exclusive or non-exclusive. Um, and when you're doing agreements for these kinds of licenses, you need to understand that if the license is not permitted by the license grant or it's not called out by the license grant, um, that may mean that you don't have uh, that particular right to do something with respect to that software or the intellectual property. Um, owning a physical copy is not the same as owning the software itself. Uh, so although I'm probably dating myself, if you're to get a copy of Microsoft Office on a CD, uh, just because you have purchased the CD, the physical copy, uh, doesn't mean that you have the right or the ownership of that software itself doesn't mean you can go out and make multiple copies or give a copy to your friend. Um, you only own the, the copy that's on that, um, that physical disk. Um, some other considerations, um, when we're talking about software as a service, um, these days vendors don't even use the term license. Um, they often speak about uh, language concerning services or rights of access or rights to use the services and applications. Um, and so because of that, you need to be very careful about um, working from standard forms. Um, uh, recently, we've seen a lot of agreements that purport to be um, uh, license agreements that were for uh, software that gets installed, um, and vendors haven't taken the time to update those forms. Uh, with new language. And so now that they're using or they're delivering their software in a software as a service model, 
um, they haven't updated their forms. And so they're, they're using agreements that include outdated language and outdated concepts. Um, similarly, you'll also see a lot of vendors trying to use um, standard services agreements or master services agreements to deliver uh, their SaaS or to contract for their SaaS solutions. Uh, and while that may be okay, um, not all services agreements are created equal. And sometimes uh, those standard form agreements don't include appropriate language uh, to cover the delivery of, of software as a service. Uh, next slide. Uh, and so we come to our first CLE code, which is 52133. Again, CLE code number one, 52133. Um, when you're contracting for any kind of uh, IT services or software, uh, it's really un important to understand the license scope. Um, so first and foremost, what is being licensed? Um, are you talking about code? Are you talking about software? Are you talking about some other aspect of intellectual property uh, or materials? Are we talking about data? Um, are we talking about um, software that's being delivered in a SaaS model or uh, software that's being installed uh, on premises or on a, on a machine or something sitting in an office? Um, what is the duration of that license? How long is the, the license for? Is it perpetual or just for a limited period uh, term? Is it being licensed on a subscription basis, meaning you need to continue to pay for it um, in order to continue to use it? And is that uh, you know, a monthly payment or an annual payment, or are you subscribing to some kind of term of years? Um, also understanding the, you know, the geographic scope potentially of that license. Um, is it enterprise-wide, meaning all of the users or um, devices within your organization, or is it limited to a specific facility or a specific set of users? Um, this is something that's drawn particular importance now in a work from home remote work environment. Um, you know, do your licenses extend to personal machines that your users may be using? Um, does it extend to somebody's home office? Um, does it extend to the license being used in some kind of other remote work environment, like through a VPN or some other virtual delivery? Um, and then are there any geographic restrictions? So again, in a remote work environment, if you're limited to license to a particular site or a particular facility, uh, if you have users working elsewhere now, are, are they still covered by the scope of that license or do you need to expand it, potentially including, you know, use in uh, you know another country outside the United States, um, or potentially from places that weren't contemplated when the you know the license was signed originally. Um, finally, you also need to consider any other quantity limitations, such as the number of processors, the number of users, um, metrics like the number of employees, the number of admissions, uh, the number of students. All these things can be um, potential limitations or um, things that are used to measure the license scope. And so understanding all of these things in your environment is really important when you set out to do one of these agreements. Um, next slide. Uh, Leah? Yeah, um, thanks, Evan. So in addition to understanding the license scope, um, it's equally important to understand uh, the location. So Evan has sort of touched on this high level in previous slides, but in um, sort of a more traditional software licensing agreement, um, the software is, a, is installed on premise, so in the customer's environment. So, you know, the customer is, is um, then going to be able to configure the software to meet its particular needs um, and is also going to retain control over its data. But when we're dealing with cloud solutions, um, which are, you know, increasingly overtaking on-premise software licensing, um, the, so the software and the customer's data are going to be hosted by the vendor, um, often in a shared environment. So, you know, multiple customers on the same server. Um, so as Evan mentioned, there, there's a bunch of different models of cloud delivery. It could be software as a service, platform at, as a service, um, remote computing, um, but when dealing with any sort of remote hosting of, of a software application and customer data, um, 
top priorities should shift from issues like specific configuration and acceptance to um, concerns about service availability and data security. Um, so to minimize those sorts of risks, you want to make sure that you're, you know, at, at the forefront conducting due diligence of um, what the, the provider's data security practices are, um, and then making sure that your agreement, the contractual language, um, sufficiently addresses, you know, any relevant requirements. So um, that might be requiring the provider to um, perform regular backups or regular data backups. Um, it could be, you know, requiring them to maintain a data security program that, you know, that has formal um, data security policies and procedures, um, maybe a business continuity and disaster recovery plan. Um, it might be requiring them to maintain and make available regular um, audits. Um, and then, you know, language requiring them to immediately notify you if there's any sort of um, security inc incident, data breach, unauthorized access to any of, of um, your customer data. Um, and then, you know, understanding where, where your data is and where it can go. So um, geographically, where is your data hosted? Um, you know, because if it's, if it's outside of the U.S., um, it may be subject to different data privacy and protection laws and regulations um, that you need to be aware of. Uh, next slide, please. Um, so specify what the product um, or service will do. So if we're talking about, you know, sort of off the shelf software products that are readily available um, for purchase and don't really involve any sort of customization or development. So things like Microsoft Office, um, QuickBooks, maybe Salesforce, um, the order form might simply just state the name of the product or service and, you know, you sort of know what it is, know what you're going to get. Um, but for more complex products, um, it really is important to include some specifications to make sure that, you know, everyone's on the same page, has a common understanding of what the features, um, the capabilities, the services are that, that the solution is going to provide. Um, and, you know, perhaps more importantly, um, having that specification will lock in uh, the vendor to the functionality that, that it has promised. Um, so, you know, there may be a situation where you've run a competitive RFP process um, and that as part of that process, you, you know, you've included specific features or capabilities or functionalities. And then the vendor's response already has, has those stated functionality commitments. So in that instance, you'll just want to make sure that those stated commitments actually become part of, of a definitive agreement. Um, but bottom line, if you know if you're contracting for any sort of custom software, uh, it is absolutely necessary to make sure you specify functionality in the order form um, to make sure that you know that that the product aligns with what your requirements are, and and to lay out um, a foundation for any recourse if if the product does not meet those requirements. Uh, next slide, please. Um, so understand how the product will be implemented. Uh, generally speaking, most products are are not going to be implemented just by you know a simple download by you. Um, instead, uh, there will be a statement of work um, that sets out you know an implementation plan. Uh, and the specific content and structure um, of of that statement of work will vary depending on the nature of the software or the project requirements or you know, preferences of, of either of the parties involved, but it's generally going to provide, um, you know, an overview of, of the implementation phase, um, what the timeline is, you know, if there are any um, deliverables, key milestones, um, deadlines, um, it should clearly define the responsibilities and expectations of each party involved in the Im implementation process. Um, it might outline, you know, testing and quality assurance processes, um, uh, and it should include a pricing overview, so a, a breakdown of all costs associated with the implement implementation. Um, so uh, using a mile a milestone based payment schedule can also be helpful. So by tying payments to certain milestones, 
um, it can be easier to monitor the the project's advancement and confirm you know that it's on track um, and and provide a level of assurance that you're actually getting value for your investment. Um, and then consider making acceptance testing a condition for your final payment. So this is going to ensure that the software you know actually satisfies the agreed upon functionality um, outlined in in the order form or the agreement. Um, and that you're paying for a working and usable product. Uh, next slide, please. So the next item to discuss is establishing performance warranties and standards. Um, and I think folks are probably generally familiar with what a warranty is and, and how it might um, be presented in a contract. But when you're dealing with, um, you know, any kind of IT solution, um, you know, as Leah was just referring to, it is really important to get ongoing commitments uh, that your, you know, software, hardware, services, um, you know, will perform as you expect, um, and to establish some remedies um, if that's not the case. Um, so that can take a number of different forms depending on. Um, the nature of the solution and the nature of the contract. Um, typically in these types of agreements, you know, first and foremost, um, you'll want the vendor to uh, warrant that the solution conforms to its documentation. Um, that can be the vendor's uh, sort of off the shelf standard documentation. Um, and whether that's, you know, on a website or that's in, um, you know, some kind of documentation the vendor actually provides along with the technology. Um, that's kind of like a, a baseline warranty that you typically see. Um, but for more complicated solutions or where there's some element of configuration or customization involved, um, or where you have built out, um, you know, specifications or requirements, you may want to tie your warranties to those um, specs or requirements as well. Um, and going even a step further, Leah mentioned before, um, you know, an RFP response. And if you've taken the time to, um, you know, get the vendor to provide an RFP response or had a vendor do a demo, or, you know, if there are specific features or functionality that you are relying on, um, you want to make sure that those get um, uh, somehow incorporated into uh, your, your product and performance warranties. Um, you know, I would never cast aspersions against a vendor, um, but I have seen, uh, you know, too oftentimes uh, vendor salespeople, uh, you know, performing a bait and switch and saying that, a, you know, a product or service is going to have, uh, you know, an important feature or functionality. And then when the rollout happens, uh, you know, that doesn't exist or it's still uh, somewhere down the, the product roadmap. Uh, and then the, the customer is left high and dry. So it's really important to, to make sure that you're documenting that. Um, another common one uh, that has you know, taken increasing, uh, increasingly uh, important role is a warranty against malicious code. Um, and these days you wanna make sure that malicious code includes um, ransomware. Uh, you know, unfortunately, ransomware is a fact of life these days, um, but having some protection from your vendors uh, in the event that they wind up transmitting you, you know, any kind of malicious payload, but in particular ransomware uh, is very important. Um, and a lot of times you'll see uh, vendors trying to couch those co uh, those warranties um, by saying that they're going to use, you know, industry standard technology, or uh, you know, they won't knowingly send you uh, malicious code. Um, I find from the customer perspective that neither of those two, two things are particularly helpful uh, because, of course, you wouldn't expect um, your vendors to, to intentionally send you malicious code. Um, so as a matter of risk allocation, um, getting a, an unqualified uh, rep and warrant about no malicious code is, is important. Um, depending on the nature of your project, you'll also uh, potentially want to consider warranties around uh, interfaces and compatibility. Um, that may be compatibility with your other existing platforms or software that you have. Uh, it may be some kind of uh, covenant or commitment as to future compatibility, um, you know, maintaining compatibility with 
you know, future operating system, uh, future industry standards, or um, making sure that the software or hardware is going to uh, remain compliant with applicable law. Um, and so that you have, again, some kind of recourse uh, if that, you know, winds up not being the case. And we'll talk a little bit more about um, maintenance and support on the next slide, um, but, but that's a, a warranty you may want to consider. Um, with respect to IT professional services, obviously a warranty that they've been done competently and by qualified trained personnel, uh, particularly if you're using an outside vendor, you also want to make sure that they have the appropriate authorizations um, or licenses from the vendor uh, so as to not void any kind of warranty um, that you might get from the, the underlying vendor. Um, you should also uh, consider whether or not there's any professional standards that may need to be adhered to. Um, and, you know, if there's a, a, a an ASMI or some other uh, applicable professional standard that you can point to objectively uh, and say that the, the warranty or the services should be performed uh, based on that, that, that often is very helpful. Um, you'll also want to consider what the duration of these warranties should be. Um, a lot of times, you know, vendors will uh, put, a, you know, maybe a 30 or 90 day uh, limitation on the warranty. Uh, oftentimes, we find that that's, you know, much too short, particularly for, uh, you know, longer term projects or projects where, you know, you may not discover a defect or an issue um, until, for example, you have a quarter or a fiscal year end uh, for a solution that's involved in accounting, um, or you have, um, you know, the change in calendar year or calendar month. Uh, and so if, if you're faced in a situation like that, or you're in uh, some other kind of solution that, that has a time component to it, you need to consider making sure the warranty duration extends, you know, beyond the point in time uh, that, you know, a defect or an issue is likely to be uh, discovered. Uh, and then finally, with respect to remedies, uh, oftentimes, uh, you know, vendors will suggest, um, you know, a repair, replace, or refund remedy. Uh, that may be helpful, but you want to make sure that those remedies are not your sole and exclusive remedy. Um, you know, obviously, depending on the nature of the issue, you may want to have the ability to pursue a vendor for other kind of damages. And uh, frequently, especially in software, uh, you know, vendors will will not only make it their sole and exclusive remedy, um, but will want to make the the course of action, you know, whether to repair, replace, or refund, um, at their discretion. And obviously, uh, they're incentivized to choose the option that's that's less costly and less painful for them. Uh, next slide, please. Um, <clears throat> so. There's when dealing with um, SaaS and cloud agreements, um, there's also sort of a special category of performance warranties and standards that you'll want to consider. Um, and those are usually documented in what's called a service level agreement, or sometimes you can see it called a, an uptime commitment or uptime guarantee. Uh, and essentially, what these are is a separate, um, a separate, usually a separate document. Um, that speaks to um, how the solution is going to perform, uh, and it may be in a number of different categories. Um, so I mentioned uptime or availability, um, and so that is, you know, hey, I'm trying to access the system. Uh, you know, am I able to log in and actually do what I need to do, or is the solution down or not responding? Uh, oftentimes, that's measured as a percentage of time in a given month uh, that the, the solution or system is available. Uh, and may include uh, some kind of carve outs or exclusions uh, for issues like force majeure or scheduled maintenance windows um, or only being measured uh, for a particular period of time. Uh, speed, latency, you know, how quickly is the solution going to return uh, a response to a command or a query? Um, you know, that's particularly important if you have a, a system that's um, uh, you know, time sensitive in terms of how quickly it's responding to you um, and, and making sure that there's no, you know, there's no lag or delay. Um, and then you may also see service level agreements um, for support requests. So how quickly is the vendor going to, uh, you know, respond to my email or my phone call 
that the system isn't working or I have a problem? And then how quickly is that issue going to get resolved? Um, oftentimes, vendors are very happy to provide a response time, um, but are not so keen on providing a resolution time. Um, and obviously, getting a, a commitment, even a targeted uh, resolution time, um, is better from a customer standpoint. So you know that the vendor isn't just going to um, respond to your email and then you're never going to hear from them again. Um, a lot of times, typical remedies for service level uh, for service level issues include credits, um, which you can think about as deductions for underperformance, uh, as well as potentially termination rights for multiple or repeated failures. Um, what I would suggest to you about all of these is that um, it's very infrequent that vendors are willing to sort of offer up an SLA, um, so you may have to ask for it. Um, and more so, if you if you do get an SLA from a vendor, uh, it may list um, the you know uptime uh, or availability commitment, but there won't be any teeth behind it uh, in terms of remedies. So you won't see service level credits attached or a termination right attached. Um, so you may need to push a vendor to you know actually put some teeth behind any of these. Um, and come up with your own, potentially your own SLA or your own credit structure um, if the vendor isn't forthcoming with one. Um, they're also, it's also really important for these to be measurable. Um, so to make sure that you have um, some way of, of not just measuring these, but getting some kind of reporting. Um, oftentimes vendors may have tools to, to provide you with a report or a dashboard or something within a solution. So it's important to know what exists there. Um, and then it's important to understand what your actual business need is here. So um, uptime and availability commitments are great, um, you know, but if you don't need the solution on a weekend or you, know, you only need it from nine to five uh, during a given day, you may want to calibrate uh, your SLA to that specific business need, um, and you know, and push for really tight timeframes or availability percentages during those windows, uh, and tell the vendor that you know you don't need as a heavy a hand, um, you know, outside of those windows. Uh, and then finally, with respect to remedies, I'll also just say that it's it's my view that you should always try to push for um, some kind of monetary remedy. Um, and in particular, you know, if the service is really terrible, um, getting additional credit for additional months of service probably isn't something that you want to have. Um, so trying to push to get a cash refund or even an invoice credit uh, is certainly preferable from a customer standpoint. Uh, next slide. Um, so when you're investing in, you know, certainly in a longer term uh, IT project, it's really important to understand how the product uh, or solution is going to be maintained and supported. Um, and to that end, it's important first to understand the difference between maintenance and support. So maintenance includes, uh, you know, bug fixes and updates and basically anything that's going to keep the, the software current. While support is best understood as uh, you know, the vendor, uh, you know, operating help desk, answering questions, uh, or being available to respond to, uh, you know, downtime or, um, you know, problems with the software. Um, when you're dealing with maintenance and support, it's, and before you engage in any kind of IT transaction, it's really important to understand what are ongoing maintenance and support fees and how those are separate from license fees. But sometimes vendors will seek to tie those two things together. Um, and so while there may just be an upfront license fee, um, they sort of conceal the fact that you need to pay maintenance and support fees in order to keep a license in effect. Um, or if you decide to forego maintenance and support, um, oftentimes vendors will seek to charge a premium if you want to re-engage maintenance and support, uh, maintenance and support and require some kind of true up for uh, maintenance and support fees that you may have missed. Um, for, for particularly mission critical projects or uh, something that you anticipate you know, having in place for a long period of time, um, getting a commitment from a vendor to the guarantee the duration of maintenance and support and how long they're going to support uh, the particular product or service is really important. 
uh, we oftentimes uh, include, depending on the project, a provision that says that the vendor can't sunset uh, or change their software for a particular period of time, or they'll continue to support it for a particular period of time, as well as a commitment uh, to support some number of prior versions uh, to ensure that you're not you know, forced uh, arbitrarily to move to the latest and greatest. Uh, and then you may also want to consider uh, some kind of cap on maintenance and support fee increases. Uh, again, uh, you know, vendors have been known to, once you've been on a product for a while, uh, jack up the maintenance and support fees, uh, and then you can be kind of stuck, um, you know, using the product or service um, because the, the vendor has, you know, increased the fee so much and you don't really have an easy exit path uh, to move to another solution. Uh, next slide, please. Um, okay, so understanding data rights, um, and this is an important one. So you want to make it unequivocally clear um, that you reserve all ownership rights in, in the data that you're submitting to the, the solution, the product, product, or the provider. Um, and you might think about defining customer data um, broadly. So, you know, it should, it should include all data, all information, all materials, et cetera, um, that are collected for or from you, the customer, or are made available um, for the customer through the service. And it, it might also include any results um, or output or derivative work um, that comes from that customer data. Um, software agreements, you know, they, they vary in whether um, or how the customer grants the provider authorization to use customer data. Um, so, you know, it might simply provide that the, the provider can use the data um, solely as necessary to provide the services under the agreement. Um, and that's that's great. Um, but keep an eye out for provisions that give the provider the right to mine or aggregate data um, in, in some form. So, you know, if you're going to allow the provider to, um, to exploit uh, commercially sensitive or personal data or customer data, um, you want to make sure that it is limited to an aggregated and anonymous form. Um, if the vendor is going to have possession of any of your data, uh, you want to make sure to include a mechanism uh, in the agreement for getting that data back, both um, upon request and on termination or, or expiration of the agreement. Um, also think about including provisions that um, that speak to a transition plan. So you know things like um, detailed instructions for the transfer back of customer data. Um, you know maybe requiring the providers uh, reasonable efforts to assist in obtaining any substitute services um, and in transitioning the services. Um, you might also try to work in uh, you know a post termination transition period. Um, during which you would have a continued right to use the service, the services, even though you know the agreement term has ended. Um, next slide, please. Oh, hey, Leah, there's a question that came in that uh, somebody asked, "What is meant by mining and aggregating data?" Um, yeah, great question. So, um, so it could be you know things like taking. Um, uh, taking statistics of usage of the software and pulling out data from that, using it to um, to improve upon the product or um, you know provide reports to other customers. Um, trying to think, Evan, do you have any other examples? Yeah, so sometimes aggregating data can mean um, you know they the vendor will collect data on one customer and will sort of add it to its database along with information of its other customers. Um, sometimes that can be for a perfectly legitimate purpose, like, uh, you know, I'm going to report, uh, you know, how all of our users answered, you know, a particular question or, um, you know, how much information they're processing through the system. Um, other times, uh, you know, vendors can independently try to sell or monetize that information. And so you just need to be um, careful, careful, um, you know, whether or not you want to do that or not. Um, okay, so our our last um, item, um, think about limitations of liability. Um, 
So because limitations of liability provisions, um, you know, generally benefit the provider more than the customer, um, you know, because the provider is going to have greater performance obligations and is likely also acting as sort of a custodian of customer data. Um, if you're working off of a provider's form agreement, um, there's likely going to be pretty aggressive limitation of liability language that unilaterally favor the provider. Um, so, you know, it, it, will probably exclude um, consequential and other specified damages. Um, it will probably cap the provider's total monetary liability based on uh, fees paid under the agreement. Um, so expect to see that, um, but know that negotiation is possible. Um, so, you know, you could try to get, you know, mutuality of the limitation of liability provisions. Um, try and get the appropriate carve out. So for things like, um, amounts paid or payable as indemnification or liability to third parties that are resulting from um, the provider's breach of um, you know, IP ownership, confidentiality, privacy, um, security of the customer's data, th those sorts of things. Um, you could also try and get a higher cap on damages. So uh, instead of you know, just limited to the fees um, paid during the last 12 months, um, you know, it could be a multiple of the fees paid, and that will both uh, work to incentivize the provider to, um, you know, minimize liability risks and also provide, you know, a, a practical remedy um, in the event that there's an issue. Um, next slide, please. Oh, hey, Leah, there's also a, a, a more of a comment in the uh, in the chat concerning limitations of liability, um, which is you know, vendors often tie the LOL to the fees paid for the particular product as opposed to the annual fee as a whole. Uh, my experience is that this is negotiable. And I would just echo that and say, absolutely, uh, limitations of liability are almost always negotiable. Um, you know, in addition to all the things that Leah mentioned uh, here, which, you know, I think we have found, uh, you know, a lot of vendors are are willing to move um, you know, considering a multiple of the contract value, you know, so not just sort of the annual fee or the fees paid under the contract, um, I find is is something um, that's, you know, again, depending on the vendor and, and the amount of spend is something that um, is certainly within negotiating range. Um, also, um, uh, you know, I also see vendors these days um, agreeing to super caps. Um, so a particular category like a breach of confidentiality or a breach of security relating to a, a security breach um, being subject to a higher cap uh, than, you know, the standard limitation of liability. Um, oh, this apparently is a pretty significant uh, topic. Um, so, yes, um, just to answer a couple other questions, um, I, I do find SAS and other non-custom agreements um, are are quite negotiable. Um, I wouldn't probably, Lee and I probably wouldn't have a practice otherwise. Um, and there are certainly opportunities to request changes to standard boilerplate T's and C's, um, particularly, you know, if you're, you know, have any kind of significant spend or a vendor, um, you know, is, is interested in getting your business or working in your particular market. Um, so, uh, you know, even some of the largest vendors, Microsoft, Oracle, um, you know, Amazon, you know, will consider changes to your form, particularly as you're getting into the, you know, hundreds and thousands or millions of dollars worth of spend. Um, and uh, just one other comment on this. Um, yes, I, I found that you can uh, negotiate to include fees paid as well as insurance. Um, that's, you know, one time or, or oftentimes a common way to um, deal with a limitation of liability provision, particularly with smaller vendors. So I hope that answers those questions. Um, so now what I suspect is, is maybe one of the reasons why um, we had so much interest in this webinar. So special considerations for contracting for uh, AI and, and frankly machine learning related services. Um, so what are the most important legal issues to consider when contracting for AI-related services? Well, um, next slide, please. 
so uh, you know here here is a list of um uh you know issues that you might consider and i think the most interesting thing about this list is that this is what chat gtp says uh, were the special considerations for contracting for AI related services. So this was actually uh, the response that chat GTP gave uh, when we put in this prompt. Uh, and actually, we, we think it's pretty good. Um, we're not going to go through uh, e each one of these sort of in detail. Uh, although I will say that for things like limitation of liability and indemnification um, and compliance and, and confidentiality and termination, you know, a lot of the considerations uh, that, you know, you might find in any kind of IT solution, you know, we're just talking about limitation of liability, for example, um, those are probably um, similar to, if not the same, uh, that you would want to uh, consider for any other, um, uh, you know, for any other IT solution you might be contracting for. Um, but we did want to drill down on a couple of these. Uh, and so, Leo, uh, you can, we can go to the next slide. Yeah, so um, the first one we want to talk about is is intellectual property rights. Um, so in AI-based solutions, um, identifying the IP at the outset is is pretty crucial. Um, the most common approach um, is going to be that the the provider owns you know the algorithms um, and the statistical models that that comprise the AI solution. Um, and the customer is going to typically own its data, so including customer data, business processes, trade secrets, um, sort of the normal things you think of as customer data. Um, but the more complex question is, um, who owns the learnings that are derived from, from machine learning and what restrictions might be placed on, on um, the use of those learnings um, for the benefit of, of the provider's other customers? So. I think as a starting point, um, the contract should, you know, clearly identify machine learning as a category of IP, um, ideally with the customer as the owner of, of the rights to those learnings. Um, but, you know, if that, if that doesn't work for the provider, which it likely may, may be an issue, there can be a discussion around what portion of those learnings the provider is claiming an interest in um, and the extent to which it expects to make those learnings available to any other customers, including those that may be, you know, co competitors. Um, so then data privacy and security, um, you know, also some, some additional considerations when we're talking about AI solutions, um, because, you know, they're relying on just massive amounts of data for training, uh, training purposes and improving their performance. Um, so it really is important to, to clearly define and communicate how data um, will be collected, how it will be used, and how it will be processed in relation to the AI solution. Um, you'll wanna make sure that the provider is, isn't collecting excessive or, or unrelated data that would pose you know, additional privacy risks. Um, and then you know, um, a specific consideration is that AI solutions um, sort of by their nature are meant to augment or or enhance data with additional information um, that has the potential to create new new personal data that individuals um, are not originally providing. So you know, think about the the privacy implications of that augmented data um, to make sure that it's complying with um, data protection regulations. Um, or you know da data privacy or privacy notices, privacy policies um, when you're using um, that augmented data. Um, and in terms of security, I mean this is this is sort of similar to um, other software models, but you know require the vendor to implement strong security measures um, that protect data from unauthorized access and disclosure. Um, you know, this could be requiring techni techniques like anonymization or um, pseudonymization um, to ensure that, you know, the, the data that they have cannot be um, easily linked back to specific individuals. Um, next slide, please. Um, so the other two considerations we wanted to um, dig a little deeper on are uh, compliance with laws and regulations, and then ethical and responsible um, AI considerations, which 
you know, sort of go hand in hand. Um, the U.S. does not yet have a comprehensive AI regular regulatory framework, um, but there are a few uh, current actors um, who are in the conversation about regulation of AI. Um, so uh, Congress has been calling for preemptive le legislation to establish um, what they call guardrails on AI products and services. Um, Back in October, uh, the Biden administration introduced a blue blueprint for an AI bill um, that called for developers to ensure safe and effective systems um, that don't discriminate or violate expectations of privacy. Um, and then the FTC, the Federal Trade Commission, has been taking a little different approach, claiming that it already has jurisdiction over large language models, um, given that uh, AI, you know, could exacerbate some of the existing pro problems in tech. Um, so things like collusion, monopolization, uh, um, mergers, price discrimination. Um, it's also claiming jurisdiction based on the risk that generative AI um, will, and, and I think already is sort of turbocharging fraud um, because of its ability to create uh, false, but, but really convincing content. Um, content. And then on a more local level, um, AI-related legislation has already been introduced in, I think, about 17 states. Um, some of the, the proposed laws actually incentivize um, local development of AI products, um, but some limit try and limit its use in applications such as healthcare um, and hiring. So I think what is clear um, is that it's critical to make sure that any use of of AI or machine learning um, services does not run afoul of restrictions that are set out um, in existing laws and regulations relating to things like privacy, anti-discrimination, um, data security, and other related frameworks. Um, you know, I know the, the Consumer Fi Financial Protection Bureau um, has voiced a concern about discriminatory, discriminatory use of AI in lending decisions. Um, similarly, the EEOC is concerned about um, using AI to make employment-related decisions about applicants and employees for the same, um, the same reasons. Um, so that really dovetails into our last point um, about ethical and responsible AI considerations. Um, so I think, you know, what's clear is that we can all see a future where uh, AI algorithms continue to, to make more and more, you know, really impactful decisions in our society. Um, but what's lacking uh, is, is insight into how those decisions are made. So, you know, with, with traditional programmed algorithms, um, we can look at the code and understand what the decision-making process was or, or, you know, what it looks like. But in the, in the case of AI, um, that really changes. And generally speaking, there isn't really a way to understand or check or verify the process. Um, so one way um, that is within our control, um, you know, to, to make sure that ethical and responsible um, considerations are being made is to incorporate those sorts of principles into contracts for AI services. Um, so, you know, identify specific ethical principles but then um, translate those into express contractual requirements that are clear, that are measurable, that are enforceable. So things like, um, you know, requiring the, the AI service provider to provide transparency reports or conduct regular audits, um, implement privacy protection measures. Um, if the AI system does involve a decision-making process uh, that, that might impact certain individuals or groups, um, specify in the contract that the service, you know, has to be designed and tested to minimize biases and um, and avoid discriminatory outcomes. Um, and you know, as ethical considerations in AI continue to evolve, um, I think it's important to commit to uh, periodic contract reviews and updates to make sure that um, that your engagements are. Um, R remain aligned with what the emerging ethical standards and practices are. Um, next slide. Oh, yeah, next slide. Sorry. And and the last code is 73212. Um, so um, I'm sure that we've all heard the warnings that 
chat GPT or, you know, another AI tool that has similar human-like um, language capabilities, uh, it could and probably will radically change how the legal industry operates. Um, and actually just this morning, there were two articles in the, I think it was the ABA um, uh, journal uh, tech monthly email um, on how chat GPT specifically is reshaping the legal field. Um, and I thought it was interesting. So one of the articles cited to a LexisNexis survey from March of this year that found that um, general awareness of chat GPT and other AI tools among lawyers was significantly higher than general consumers. It was 86% compared to 57%. Um, and that the majority of those lawyers aware of, of chat GPT and AI tools believe that generative AI tools will increase the efficiency of lawyers, paralegals, and law clerks, um, and that nearly half are all already using or you know have imminent plans to use Chat GPT in their work. Um, so you know I think what is clear is that Chat GPT is not a replacement for you know actual human legal analysis. Um, and actually, OpenAI, the creators of Chat GPT, have come out and warned that Chat GPT should not be relied on for legal advice. Um, so, you know, while Evan and I both thought that, you know, chat GPT's response to our, our general question of, you know, what are the important legal issues to consider um, when contracting for AI related services, uh, you know, we thought it did do a pretty good job of identifying a, at a high level, the list of key issues. Um, we were pleased that it concluded with this disclaimer on, you know, the importance of consulting with legal professions who specialize in AI technology, AI and technology law, um, you know, if nothing else, but to secure our, our jobs for a while longer. Uh, uh, with, with that, I, I think uh, we have time for uh, maybe one uh, or, or two questions. Um, we, we've answered a number of questions in the chat already, um, but there was a question about, um, can you please provide more information regarding the difference between hosted cloud, SaaS, ASP, and remote computing in terms of where the data is stored? Um, so that's a good question, and it really can depend uh, on the, the architecture of the solution. Um, so a hosted solution could be um, hosted internally, um, you know, in an internal data center, uh, that you know that you control, or it could be hosted at a third-party data center uh, that you know that you contract for. Um, whereas a, a cloud model uh, is generally understood to be uh, you know sort of distributed hosting, uh, and so depending on again the architecture of the solution, that could be um, you know across a number of geographies depending uh, on on how it's built um, and the nature of the vendor. Uh, similarly, with a, a SaaS solution, um, a lot of times uh, SaaS vendors in what's called a multi-tenant environment, meaning uh, sort of a single uh, a single instance that is used by multiple people, um, that may be uh, hosted in a data center that is is somewhat local or regional to where the user is, um, you know, to where the user is sitting. But that's not necessarily always the the case, um, and in fact, depending on the provider, uh, you know, you may have a, a SaaS solution um, where your data is being stored in one location, but actually delivered um, from somewhere else. Uh, and similarly, with ASP uh, application service provider, um, you know, a term that's not used as much anymore, um, but I would say that that is probably very similar to a SaaS solution uh, in terms of how it's delivered. Uh, and then remote computing uh, depends on how, uh, the, again, how it's architected. You may have um, that be hosted locally in a, you know, a data center that you control or in a third party data center or in an infrastructure as a service uh, provider um, platform like a, a, a Microsoft Azure or an AWS. Um, so we're at time now. Um, uh, uh, this concludes today's webinar. Um, thank you all for your comments and participation. We really appreciate it. Please remember to keep an eye out uh, for our follow-up email, which will include links to the programming materials, the webinar recording, and the CLE information. Uh, and finally, um, if we did not get to your questions, we'll do our best to send you a response via email. In the meantime, please feel free to reach out to Leah or me with any other questions you may have. 
Thanks very much. Have a good day. Thank you.